Hey guys, Chris here again and in this video I'm going to show you how to use TensorBoard to understand your agents and improve training. When I started creating the hyperparameters video, I figured out that TensorBoard is a great help when it comes to optimizing the hyperparameter values. So I decided to make a ML Agents TensorBoard video first. TensorBoard is a TensorFlow toolkit for visualization, and both TensorBoard as well as TensorFlow are automatically installed when installing ML Agents. Why? Because ML Agents uses TensorFlow for their implementations of PPO and SAC. And because they are implemented using TensorFlow, we can easily use TensorBoard. But there might be one question unanswered. What is TensorFlow? In a nutshell, it's a huge machine learning framework developed and maintained by Google. We can start TensorBoard with the comment tensorboard logdir and then the path to our summaries folder that gets created additionally to our models folder when we train. When started successfully, you can access it through a web browser on your local machine. It's running on port 6006. Please note that when using ML Agents Release 3, the structure of generated files has changed a bit and you need to point to the results folder instead of the summaries folder. In TensorBoard, we can see graphs that show data collected during training. On the left, you can select the training run or the training runs that we want to have graphs for. On the right side are four categories named environment, is training, losses and policy. When opening TensorBoard, you can directly see two graphs of the environment category and one in the is training category. Before we start going through the graphs and their meanings, I want to quickly show you the text tab, where you can see the configurations that were used for different training runs. This is a great way to quickly verify that the correct configuration parameters were used for your training runs. Let's now start with the graphs. The cumulative reward graphs shows the reward an agent got on average per episode. In the 3D ball environment, the highest value would be 500. That is if the agent is holding the ball on its head for the whole episode which lasts a maximum of 5000 steps. Why is the highest value 500 then? Cause the agent gets a reward of 0.1 for each step not dropping the ball. The episode length graph shows the average number of agent decisions during an episode. One decision that the agent takes is locked as one step in TensorBoard. So keep in mind that this value changes when you change the decision period in the decision requester. For the 3D ball, the decision period is 1. So logically, the episode length can go up to 5000. If we would change the decision period to 5, the maximum episode length would be 1000. That's it for the environment graphs. And I think this is a great point to remind you that the summary frequency parameter not just defines the logs printed on the console, but also how granular those graphs are. The third visible graph is called is training. It's always one for training runs and always zero for inference runs. Inference is the state when you run an agent that has a model attached and is therefore not training anymore. You might have already started an agent in inference mode by running your environment with a brain attached to the agent and not using ML agents learn. That works, but no data for TensorBoard is generated. If you want to generate data from an inference run, you need to use the hyphen hyphen inference argument together with hyphen hyphen resume and either a valid run ID from a previous run or a new run ID. If you use a new run ID, make sure to use the hyphen hyphen initialize from argument with the run ID of the model that you want the inference run to be based on. You might have asked yourself why one should record an inference run at all. Well, during training it often happens that the agent isn't receiving a perfect score, cause he might still explore to find better solutions. With inference, the agent is exploiting the environment and does not explore anymore. So the training score might be a bit lower than the inference score. If your agent is deployed into a game, it will do so in inference and not training mode. So you'd want to know its exact reward score. 
Next category is called losses and consists of four graphs, policy loss and value loss, which is shown for both PPO and SAC, and Q1 and Q2 loss, shown for SAC only. Let's start with policy loss. Think of a policy as a complex set of rules stating how to behave in different situations. During training, the agent learns a policy that maximizes its reward. The policy loss determines how much the policy changes. It's like with humans. As a baby, our policy loss is stronger because our whole brain is shifting around and makes new connections everywhere. The older we are, the more strengthened the structures in our brain are. That's also why it's harder to learn something new then. Same with our agent and the policy loss, which should show a slow downwards trend over time if training progresses successfully. The value loss is a bit more complicated. This value should first increase and then decrease when the average reward stabilizes. Sounds confusing? Yeah, it kinda is, but let's get a grip on this one. The agent assigns each state he encounters a value that reflects how valuable the state is in respect to future estimated rewards that the agent might receive from his state onwards. So when the agent becomes better and better in getting rewards, many of the state values are increasing, but slowly, and this results in an increasing discrepancy between the state values and the real values to which the agent slowly adjusts. The longer and higher the reward acceleration, the higher the discrepancy. As soon as the reward stabilizes, the value loss should go down cause the state values are continuing to adjust to their true values, which are not changing that much anymore. It can also happen that the value loss is decreasing the whole time, or they start decreasing very early like in my graph here. That's no problem at all and I think this happens in my case because the 3D ball example is not really complex. Note that I earlier said the agent assigns each state he encounters a value. That's not directly true, cause most of the environments are too complex to even get a value for 1% of all possible states. That's why similar states with minimal differences are grouped to one state. How? with neural networks and the complex mathematical functions they represent and adjust. As said earlier, you'll see two more loss graphs when using the SAC algorithm, Q1 and Q2 loss. Both will likely look similar cause they are trained the same way. So why are there two then? When talking about SAC in the last video, I said they often use samples from a so-called experience replay buffer. Those samples are randomly drawn and can therefore hugely affect training positively or negatively. To ensure more stability during training, the SAC creators use two networks that somehow synchronize each other. I haven't looked into it in detail, to be honest, cause those algorithms are a mess of mathematical functions. But yeah, anyway, that's why they're two. Combined, they have the exact same chart as the value loss graph. So the only information you can get from them is if there are discrepancies between their two Q networks. If there are, I think the agents are either not getting enough samples in a sparse environment or the size of the replay buffer is too small. The last section is named policy, consisting of seven graphs. I'll start with the beta, entropy coefficient and entropy graph cause they're all related to the exploitation exploration trade-off. Beta is the trade-off value for PPO, while entropy coefficient is the one for SAC. You can see that beta decreases linearly, resulting in less and less exploration over time. Entropy coefficient, on the other hand, decreases exponentially, resulting in strong exploration at the beginning and nearly no exploration after the first half of training. You can change the start values for both graphs through the config when changing the associated hyperparameters named beta and init underscore and qf. Note that beta was introduced with release 3, so you might not see it when using an earlier version. The entropy graph shows how sure the agent is of its actions and should therefore decrease over time. It has different values for PPO and SAC because it is directly influenced by the beta and entropy coefficient values. So I'd recommend showing it for either PPO or SAC. Otherwise, the scale of the graph is out of proportion for the other one. 
I'll talk more about how to read the graph to adjust the beta and init underscore and coef parameter in the hyperparameter video. So in a nutshell, you should increase the associated parameter value when the entropy drops too quick compared to the reward increase and vice versa. Next one is the epsilon graph, which is related to the epsilon hyperparameter and is only available for PPO. It starts with the value set in the config and should decrease linearly to close to half the value it had at the beginning of training. More about epsilon in the hyperparameters video. The last three graphs are for both PPO and SAC. Let's start with the extrinsic reward graph, which is quite easy to understand. It shows you the same as the cumulative reward graph, cause we are just using extrinsic rewards. If we had also used curiosity, we could compare this graph with the cumulative one to see how the reward proportions change during training. Next one is the extrinsic value estimate graph and shows the average state value that the agent encountered during the last period. The graph can fluctuate but should steadily increase when the agent is not exploring so much anymore. The y-axis value itself is related to the gamma value that is set in the config. Let me explain you why. A value of 0.99 for example means that the agent takes decisions that will accumulate the most rewards during the next 100 steps. So the agent tries to look 100 steps into the future to choose the best action. In our example, the value is 10 when the agent is perfectly trained. That is because every time step the agent receives a reward of 0.1 for holding the ball on its head. If the agent is sure that he can balance the ball forever, nearly all states he finds itself in have a value of 10 cause the agent thinks, yeah, from this state I know what to do, I won't drop the ball during the next 100 steps and will receive a total reward of 10. This then gets re-evaluated each step with the same conclusion. So the chain goes on forever and the agent's average extrinsic value is 10. If we would change gamma to 0.98, the agent would only look 50 steps into the future and a perfect extrinsic value estimate would change from 10 to 5. Last, we have the learning rate graph. That's another easy one. There are two possible values named linear and constant that you can set in the config through a parameter called learning rate schedule. I'll talk more about this in the hyperparameter video. For now, just remember that in most of the cases you should use linear for PPO and always use constant for SAC. That's it, everything else in TensorBoard should be quite self-explanatory when playing around with it. If you find something in there that is still not clear to you, feel free to write a comment or join the Bot Academy community in Discord and ask there. Invite link in the description. What we've not covered in this video are graphs that show up when using curiosity, gale and behavioral cloning, curriculum training or self-play. Those will be covered when explicitly talking about these topics in other videos. I'd also like to let you know that I created a Patreon account in case you want to support me because I'd love to do YouTube full-time next year when I've finished my thesis. But I'm not a robot yet and still need to pay for food and rent. Link in the description as well. If you want to support me without paying anything, please make sure to like this video and follow my channel cause that's what the YouTube ranking bot likes to see. Thanks and I hope to see you in the next video.